This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I feel right. right. I was so and I just happy. thought, well, I figured it out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. Quick note, we have shows coming up in Boston and London, and in New York, in Queens and Brooklyn. Go to storycollider.org for more info. This week's story is from Nick Hudd. The story was recorded in March 2014 at the New American Shakespeare Tavern in Atlanta, Georgia, and was part of the Atlanta Science Festival. Tonight I'd like to talk to you about something that's even more important than science, which is my mother. (laughs) My mother is a really amazing person, and she, she is one of the people that I most admire in this world. She's really shaped me to be who I am more than anyone else. My mother has always been a big supporter of higher education. She's also been a very, very devout Roman Catholic. My mother worked hard to put me through Catholic school. 16 years of Catholic school. So when I told my mother that I wanted to be a scientist, uh, she was very supportive. She didn't have a background in science at all, but she thought that being a scientist was a noble profession and it could be something that could help the world be a better place. So naturally, when I began doing research, I wanted to share with my mother the excitement, the joy of scientific discovery. However, that's difficult when you're working on how DNA is packaged in sperm cells. (laughs) Yes, sperm. I avoided it for a long time. (laughs) And then one day, just weeks after defending my thesis, sitting in my parents' kitchen, my mother asked me to explain to her what I had done to earn my PhD. So I started at the beginning, and I talked to her about DNA, told her about DNA. Then we talked about chromosomes. And then we got to the point where I had to say, Sperm. (laughs) After about the fifth time that I said sperm, we were both feeling really awkward. (laughs) So she mercifully offered, your research sounds really interesting, but it's also really complicated. Maybe we should talk about it another time. (laughs) So I was all too happy to change the subject. It got a lot easier when I became a postdoc. No longer was I working on sperm. I was working on something called telomeres. These are DNA structures that are at the end of our chromosomes. So when my mother asked me again to talk to her about my research, it was a lot easier. I told her that the ends of chromosomes have these special DNA structures that are very important when cells are dividing They help maintain chromosomes, as we call it. And I said that by understanding these structures, we might be able to find a cure for some cancers. So my mother thought, this is great. She clearly is very proud of me. It seemed like she understood everything this time. And a little while later, I heard her giving a summary of my research to one of my siblings. And that's when I realized All she had heard come out of my mouth was, 
Wah, 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 wah. I'm going to cure cancer. Wah, 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 wah. Well, that wasn't really an accurate summary of my research, but it was something that she could tell her friends without blushing. Right? So we had made some progress. So when I got to Georgia Tech, uh, I started doing some research on the origin of life. And in particular, I started looking into the origin of RNA. And after a few years, we were fortunate enough to receive a grant from NASA for this research. So I was very proud of this, and I wanted to share this with my mother. She lived near the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and she'd always thought the smartest people work for NASA. So I thought, this is great. I call her up and I tell her that NASA is now funding our research. She was really perplexed because why is NASA going to fund somebody that's going to cure cancer, right? <laughs> Well, I explained to her that's not what it's about. They're not funding cancer research. You see, NASA, part of their mission is to explore for life in the universe. And so as part of that mission, they want to understand the origin of life on Earth. And that's what I was working on, to try to figure out how life started on Earth. To which she responded, <laughs> why isn't it just OK to accept that the Lord did it? Well, I didn't really have a good scientific explanation for that, so I just let it go. Um, and a few years went by, and then after 25 years of trying to talk to my mother about my research and explain it to her, help came, so to speak, out of the blue. I received an invitation to present a lecture at St. John's Seminary in Los Angeles. As part of their course on science and religion, they asked me to come speak to the seminarians about the origin of life. Now, St. John's Seminary is the largest seminary in the country, largest Catholic seminary. And uh, my mother, she was born in Los Angeles and baptized in 1924 has been a practicing Catholic as part of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles for 89 years. Uh, my mother remembered when St. John's opens its doors in 1939. She's also proud of the fact that in elementary school, she even helped raise money to build St. John's. So to her, St. John's is really the height of education. As part of my invitation to give a lecture at St. John's, I was also invited to attend Mass and to have dinner with the seminarians before my lecture. And I was welcome to bring a guest. Now, there couldn't be anybody else to invite except my mother, right, as a guest. So I called her up, told her about the invitation, and she was actually speechless for a moment. And then all she could say was, what will I wear? <laughs> when we arrived at the seminary, we were greeted by the Monsignor. Now, the Monsignor is the head of the entire seminary. He welcomed us. He opened the gates. We came in, went through the main entrance, and he showed us a plaque which had the names of the graduates of St. John's that had gone on to become bishops and cardinals. My mother looked at the list, and without blinking an eye, she started naming off the men on the list that she knew on a first name basis. They had been in her high school class or in her older brother's high school class in downtown Los Angeles. My mother really became this kind of Catholic celebrity that <laughs> night at the seminary. After dinner, we entered the prayer hall where I was to give my lecture, and I was surprised to see that there were about 200 people in attendance. In addition to the seminarians, people from the surrounding parishes had come to hear my lecture on the origin of life. And there, in the front row, there were two seats marked reserved. One was for the Monsignor, and one was for Mrs. Hud, my mother. 
And she was just beaming when the seminarians brought her over and sat her down next to the Monsignor in front of 200 people to hear her son lecture at St. John's about science. So I started off talking about fossils and about how fossils teach us about evolution. And I talked about how when we look at the side of a hill, we can see these lines when a road is cut through that are what we call the sedimentary layers. These are the layers that are laid down by the sediment in an ocean many years ago, millions, sometimes even billions of years ago. And I told them that when we dig down through these layers, it's like going back in time. And that as we find their fossils of plants and animals, these are species that lived long before any humans ever walked on the earth. I went on to talk about how evolution takes place at the molecular level. I told them that sometimes evolution happens because there are mistakes made in DNA during copying of DNA. And that this is kind of like how mistakes would be made when a monk in medieval times would make a mistake in copying a manuscript and it wasn't allowed to correct this mistake and so it would live forever. They all seemed to follow it and then at the end of my lecture after three hours, the longest lecture I'd ever given, the Monsignor stood up and he thanked me for my lecture. And then he went on and he said that he enjoyed my description, my explanations of evolution so much. And that in fact, that my discussion of the origin and evolution of life had only increased his appreciation for the beauty of God's creations on earth. I can see my mother was ecstatic at this. Yeah. <laughs> I had actually taught something to the Monsignor, and he liked it. But really, my biggest thanks came that night when we were driving home. My mother turned to me and she said, in your lecture you talked about those lines on a hillside that we see when a road is cut through. She said, I've always wondered why those were there and what they meant. She said, what you told us was so interesting. I'm never going to look at those lines the same way again. That's when I felt that after 25 years, I had finally been able to share with my mother the true excitement and beauty of scientific research. That was Nick Hud. Nick was born in Los Angeles, California. He has studied the structure and function of DNA in various cells and viruses for over 25 years. Since joining the faculty at Georgia Tech in 1999, his laboratory has become increasingly involved in the search for the chemical origins of life, with a focus on the origin of RNA. He is currently director of the NSF NASA Center for Chemical Evolution and associate director of the Pettit Institute of Bioengineering and Bioscience. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Also, we depend on listeners like you for our support. If you're able, please consider donating at storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and R.A. Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the New American Shakespeare Tavern for hosting the show to the Atlanta Science Festival for being amazing, and to life for beginning. Thanks for listening. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov slash careers.